Coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. They're literally stepping into a spiritual position, and if they are not spiritually minded, they'll see all this stuff coming against them, and they want to give up, and then they will give in, and they will conform to the wickedness that is in the world that is coming against them. But those that are strong will and know their God, they're going to be able to step into the role. They're going to know they are there for a spiritual reason. Esther said, I came into the kingdom for such a time as this. And with one woman, God was able to take down the spirit that wanted to annihilate the entire uh, genealogy of Jews off the earth. And God used one woman to shut down that plot. All it takes is somebody that knows who they are, Christ Jesus. And the word of God is in their spirit that has given them dominion over that principality, over that power. And they will not succumb. They will not yield. They will not bow. They will not bend. They will not back up from what God has put in their hearts to do. You will not sell out. I bring you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for tuning in today to Keys to Kingdom Living. I'm your host, Pastor Asa Dockery, coming to you from the World Harvest North Sanctuary. If you're new to the television ministry of Keys to Kingdom Living, I'll invite you to go to our website, whcnorth.org. There you can learn everything about this ministry and how God is using us to bring disciples out of the world into God's kingdom and teach them the truth of God's word. Today I'm excited to announce to you we're bringing you the fourth message in a series that God literally birthed in my spirit as I was sleeping one evening. And I woke up and God started giving me the foundation for these messages. There's seven in all. Today's the fourth. It's entitled Bringing the Spiritual into the Natural. When Satan tempted Eve with the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, it caused both she and Adam to sin against God, and Satan purposed to do that through the serpent so as to try to thwart and stop the plan of God in the earth. And of course, God would not allow that. God brought Jesus Christ, and through him, we as Christians are able to bring the supernatural into the natural realm. You get to be a part of that. It's exciting. Get out the Word of God. Go with me. And let's hear bringing the spiritual into the natural. And as I look back over what God has been saying through these messages, I see an overarching theme. If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Satan has tried to build up so many walls and to separate us from God. He was able, to, through sin, to separate us from God's life, but never separate us from God's love. And he didn't see that one coming. And so these sermons have been able to instill faith in people's hearts and hope in the times that we're living in. God's always got a plan. It doesn't matter what the devil's doing. It looks bad in the natural, but God says you better look in the, the spiritual because it's greater there. And so we need to bring the spiritual into the natural, not complain about the natural. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things, say all things. All things were made through Him. Through who? The Word. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. And then down in, in verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word, spiritual, became flesh, natural, and dwelt among us. God showed us there in the Gospel of John how that He is able to bring the spiritual into the natural. And then through that process, create a transformation inside our hearts and lives so that whatever the enemy has meant for evil to try to separate us from our God, Jesus has set it straight. Now we understand and know that God is for us, and when he's for us, we know who can be against us, nobody. And so it has to build faith in our hearts. 
But we have to get to that place of understanding that through Christ Jesus, we've been given the victory. It's more than just salvation, that one day when we die, Jesus is going to take us to heaven. It's about having victory in this life right now. So I'm going to ask you a question, then we're going to answer it. How can we, being carnal beings, and be able to bring the spiritual into the natural world? Jesus tells us in John 15, apart from him, we can do nothing. Paul tells us in Philippians 4 that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. God has a divine plan and purpose for every person's life. For every person's life. I know the plans that I think, the thoughts that I think for you to give you a hope in the future. But we as humans have to undergo, undergo a process so that God's will and not ours is fulfilled in the natural realm. And then you have that war between your will and God's will. And until we submit our will to God's will, His will cannot be done. And we will be frustrated because our untapped spiritual potential is not being utilized. Amen? Amen. You want to be utilized. You want to enjoy the fullness that God through Christ has given us as Christians in this world. Now, in the beginning, there was God. Everything that has come into existence began in the heart of God. The Word was with God in the beginning because the Word was God. And whenever God desired something that He saw from the imagination of His heart, He spoke that thing into existence and it appeared. God said and God saw. God said and He saw. He spoke what He, he wanted and it became what He said. God was not limited to only making inanimate, lifeless, inactive objects. As God spoke, His Word produced life and power that made the Word become what was pictured within the heart of God. I love that. If God wanted rocks and, and mountains to appear, the Word had the power to bring them to pass. If God wanted animals and plant life to exist on earth, the Word had the power to bring them into being. Whatever God saw, God said, and then the Word brought it to pass with the Holy Spirit, and it became what God said. So why is it what God's saying being done on the earth? Because He's got to work through vessels. He has given us dominion over the earth. I just, I just, ugh. us, y'all. Not the government, Amen. not the judicial system, yes. not politicians. He's given it to us, the authority to change the natural realm and to bring goodness on the earth. Lord, help us. Yes. It's us, y'all. Yes. The Word of God is completely sufficient in and of itself. That's all you need is faith in God's Word. When the, when the Lord speaks a word into your heart, and you receive that promise by faith, God's Word has the power then to produce whatever God has promised to you. You've heard a word from God. You've heard promises from God. You've read promises out of God's Word, and the Holy Spirit says that promise is for you, and, and something inside of you, your faith latches to that, and you know it's as good as done. Nothing's changed in the natural. Things don't look any better. It still looks dark. But there's something that has transformed on the inside of you through your faith. And a word has gotten down inside of your spirit and became a part of your being. And you cannot deny it. Peter says, where else can we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. He couldn't deny it at that point. There was something that had taken place inside of his heart and his life. The problem isn't the Word being able to become what God intended it to produce. The problem comes once we receive God's promise or Word in our hearts by faith. Are we going to carry that promise in our heart and spirit until God's timing is right to make that Word manifest? You have need of endurance, the writer of Hebrews says, after you have done the will of God that you might receive the what? The promise of God. So we do God's will, and then we've got to wait for the manifestation of the promise. Come out from among them, Abram, and be ye separate. So when he finally, after 25 years, decided to separate himself totally and completely from his family, then God was able to give them the promise a year later. 
It took a while for it to manifest. And so we do not need to grow weary in doing well, for in due season we will what? We will reap if we faint not. We got to keep on keeping on. We got to keep on abiding, and we're going to reap. Reap means you're going to have increase. God's going to give you increase. It doesn't matter if man is cutting back or cutting out or shutting down. God says, I've got you in, in the palm of my hand, and I am the giver and the sustainer of life. And if you abide in me, I will cause you to prosper. I'll cause you to be in health even as your soul prospers. You don't need man. All you need is faith in God and in God's Word, and he will bring the increase upon your life. I wish somebody would help me preach this this morning. All we need is faith in God in this house and God can do anything at any time for anybody that has the faith to receive it and the endurance to believe it until you receive it in your heart and life but too many times people give up before the word has time to manifest his promises that's the problem we got to have some patience in this place so if you don't have patience I'll be praying for you to have patience then you'll be praying for me to stop praying for you to have patience. <laughs> Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every, say every. This is such a sad scripture. That every intent of the thoughts of his heart, man's heart, was evil continually, and it said only. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. As I have covered in previous messages in this series, Satan was successful to get mankind to defile ourselves through rebellion and sin. Satan wanted us to defile ourselves so that a holy God wouldn't be able to commune with us and fulfill his divine plan through us because we are born into this world with evil hearts. Jeremiah 17, 9 states that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and who can know it? Every thought, every intent was only evil in the hearts in Noah's day continually. Wow. So I ask this question. How can a holy God enter a person who is filled with wickedness and sin and his holy presence not destroy that person? Imagine that God has called you to be born of the lineage of the Levitical priesthood. You, you studied the law and the ordinances of God for years as a young man, awaiting for the day that you're chosen to be the high priest for Israel so that you're able to enter the holy place in the temple of God and to offer sacrifices unto the Lord to atone, which meant back then to cover because God couldn't take away the sin of man through the blood of an animal. So the atonement that they got each year, because in every time, every year as they came on the Day of Atonement, they had to rehearse their sins, confess them over and over. And so you've waited all this time to be allowed to go into that holy place to offer up sacrifice on behalf of your people to atone for their sins. Now imagine that you're in the presence of God, the presence of God, y'all. And if you do one thing, does not, does not align with God's will for you as the high priest. God's power strikes you dead without warning. As a precaution, what they did was they would tie a rope to the ankle of the high priest, and they had bells on the garments, and as long as that, that priest was in there, he would move because it would let them outside the veil know, I'm still alive in here. But if they ever heard the bells stop ringing, they knew something's not right. And so eventually, if he did not come out, they pull on that rope and they drag him out. He was dead. It's a serious thing to fall into the hands of a living God, y'all. 
Now imagine that that same power is residing in you. Wow. They do one thing wrong, dead. That same power, that same presence, that same God, if you're a Christian, is living in you today. He's inside of you, and we get to live to tell people that he's in us. But here's my question. How is a holy God able to reside in fallen man without destroying us? Simple. Jesus is our high priest, but he was also our sacrificial lamb. I want you to think about that dichotomy. Here he is. He's one man. He's God. He's God incarnate in the flesh. He's not only the high priest, but he also presents himself as a sacrificial lamb. All right. When there was a high priest, they go kill a lamb and present it. Jesus says, I'm the high priest, and I'm presenting myself as the lamb. He presented himself to the Father as payment for the sin. Hang with me. We're going somewhere. He presented himself to the Father as full payment for the sin of all. Say all. Not just the Jews, but for the Jews and the Gentiles forever. He paid the price for man's sin. Because our sacrifice was perfect and our high priest is perfect, he, Jesus, pleased the Father. And because he pleased the Father, the wrath of God has been satisfied on our behalf forever because Jesus fulfilled all of God's requirements that made it possible for God's, here it is, for God's holy presence to enter our bodies and it not kill us. This is what makes me quake in my boots, so to speak, is how in the Old Testament, People would die in, in God's presence if they touched the, the mountain of God where God's presence was on top of Mount Sinai. If they just touched the mountain, they would die. And they had to put barriers up to keep people from dying and touching that mountain because if they do, they would die. And yet we esteem the, the holy presence of God very lightly in our day and time. We mingle our sin with the presence of God. We bring our idols in with our worship. And we do not understand because we have lost to a large degree in the body of Christ in our generation the fear of the Lord. Ananias and Sapphire says, let's make an agreement. It was a husband and a wife. We sold the land for such and such, and so we're going to bring this much in. We're not going to tell them all that we did. And so they, they plotted to lie against the Holy Spirit. And so the Ananias comes in there, lies, tells Peter this. And Peter says, why have you conspired to lie against the Holy Spirit? He didn't say, why did you conspire to lie against me, an apostle? He said, you lied against the Spirit of God. And he fell dead. And, and, uh, and Sapphire comes in later afterwards, and she, she makes the same lies, makes the same statements. So it was a conspiracy. And she lies against the Holy Spirit and says, we sold the land for such and such, and, and so here are the proceeds. And he says, the same men that carried your uh, husband's dead body out is coming now, and they're going to take you out. And she fell dead instantly. Don't you think that brought fear upon the church of the living God? We've got to have the fear of the Lord back in the house of God so that the, the super can get on our natural and the natural can become spiritual and we can see miracles raw in, a, in the house of God. We can, there's where it is. If we can get the fear of the Lord back in the house of God, there's going to be some miracles. There's going to be some salvation. There's going to be some signs and wonders because God is going to confirm his truth with signs and wonders. I know this isn't popular, but it's truth. We need to learn once again how to fear the Lord. So how, I asked you all ago, but now I want to answer it. How can a holy God enter a person who is filled with wickedness and sin and his holy presence not destroy that person? He can't. Something has to change in us first. So let's talk about that. Romans 10 verse 5. Y'all okay? You like the truth? Verse 5 in Romans 10, it says, For Moses writes about the righteousness, but this righteousness is of the law. 
The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your what? In your heart. It can't just be in your mouth. You've got to be hearers and doers of the word, that the word will be in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you what? If you confess with what? Your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You've got to confess it. You've got to believe it. And when you confess and believe and it's, it's agreement between your mouth and your heart, God says it's done. It's done. we got to get our hearts and our confession aligned. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. So when you hear the word of God and you hear that Jesus saves and you hear and believe the truth that Jesus saves, when you believe in that word, it makes you righteous apart from works. And with confession, it is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will what? Will not be put to shame. Satan can't put us to shame because our faith is not in ourselves. It's not in our works. It's in what Jesus Christ has done, and there is no shame in what Jesus has done for us. Now, God cannot enter an unholy vessel. This is why God requires us to first, here it comes, confess faith in Jesus as the only begotten Son of God, and through our confession of faith in Jesus, we are then made what? Righteous in God's sight, apart from the works of the flesh. And once we are made righteous through our faith in Jesus, God is able to give us his Holy Spirit. You have to be made righteous first. You do that through believing and confessing the Lord Jesus and that God raised him from the dead. When you're made righteous through faith, then God gives you the Holy Spirit. Now his Spirit is entering a righteous vessel. God, are you hearing me? Once we receive the Holy Spirit into our being, we are able to contain God's holy presence in our being and not be destroyed by it. That's what God's Spirit does. That's what Jesus' sacrifice on the cross did for us. And our faith in that work on the cross has made us righteous in right standing in God's eyes as if we had never, ever sinned. To be remembered no more, God said. I will remember your sin no more. I'll never bring it up to you ever again once you have confessed it and gotten it under the blood. Now, Genesis 3. We're laying the foundation. Verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the ground, or the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you what? Die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day... You eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. How do we make a confession of faith, y'all? With a mouth. With a mouth, confession is made. That's what the Bible just said, Romans 10, right? Stay with me. We speak God's word out of our mouths unto salvation by faith. Isn't it coincidental, is it, that with the mouth, Satan was able and allowed by Adam and Eve to defile our innocent souls and defile our hearts with sin, the mouth. Before we leave you today, I want to thank you for tuning in and watching the message today, bringing the spiritual into the natural. Also, if you would like to hear the entire series of messages in their entirety, you can call the church office. We are offering all seven CDs for the price of $20, and we'll get it out to you as promptly as possible. Be sure and let the operator know that you want the series of messages entitled Against the Odds, and we'll get it out to you promptly. For those that's been watching today, I want to encourage you. What's going on in your life? 
Where are you standing with Christ? Are things all right with you or is your spirit unsettled? You have no peace. The Lord has prompted me to pray for those that have no peace today. Just hang on and let God minister to you right now. I didn't plan this, but I feel the Holy Spirit is telling me to do it. What is robbing you of your peace? Think of it. Is it financial? Is it your job? Is it something going on in your life? Is it something with your family? The Bible says, cast all your care on God because he cares for you. And then pray and believe, and the peace of God will guard your heart and mind. Father, I pray for the individuals that have no peace today. You've stopped what we were going to do to minister to those that need your peace. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. And I speak your peace over my brothers and my sisters. And let your peace guard their hearts and minds right now against the lies of the enemy. That's what it is. The lies of the enemy steal our peace. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came that you may have life and have it to the full. I release your peace upon them. That fear and anxiousness has to go, and your presence is filling the room where they're at. Receive that peace, because in the presence of God is fullness of joy. Let joy from God fill your heart right now. He's got this. How do I know that? Because he's telling me to tell you, and I know what God can do in a moment. He's done it for me many, many times. So just... Take a deep breath and let God fill you with his goodness and joy and peace. Before I leave today, I want to encourage you, if you have any prayer requests or praise reports, how God has ministered to you through this television ministry, I'd love to hear from you. We would love to hear from you. Email us, prayer at whcnorth.org, prayer at whcnorth.org, or you can call the church office information bill on the bottom of the screen. And then finally, we have a new church app and a new website. You can download the app. Go to your app store, World Harvest Church North, and there you can download it onto your phones, televisions, and Roku devices, and you're able to stay connected with this ministry 24-7. We're all about discipleship here. And for those that's been watching for a while and you know the integrity of this ministry, you know that we are consistent with preaching the truth and back it up with the Word of God. We'd love for you to take that next commitment. God has given us a vision for 100 covenant partners. Will you be one of those covenant partners that will stand with this ministry so that we can go to the nations of the world in a greater capacity than we have been able to before this point? Prayerfully consider that, and then email us and let us know what you would like to do to help us out. All the information is on the website, whcnorth.org. And we want to say... Thank you and God bless you to those that have taken, taken the burden to help us financially. You're a blessing to us. You help us hold our arms up so that we can continue what God's called us to do in the natural, and that's to make disciples of nations. Till this time next week, keep your eyes on Jesus because he is the completer of your faith. God bless you.